This series is just getting better and better. I can't quite pin down to a T what exactly makes this series so excellent aside from the fact that I'm finding less and less to complain about and more and more stuff to praise. There is also of course the element of surprise at stake here too. As I mentioned previously, I don't really know what's going to happen in this series. Even events that have happened in the books may just disappear from the show entirely as we are making progress in such strange directions it's difficult to keep track of what will happen and what has been missed. This week Week's review is going to be slightly different in that I'm going to discuss each plotline without jumping back and forth like the show does to prevent confusion and hopefully create a coherent argument. Anyway, that's enough preamble, I think, so without further ado, here is my latest Game of Thrones review. <laughs> that rhymed. <laughs> The introduction to the Hound was fucking fantastic. I kind of thought this would come up at some point due to Gravedigger theory being so damn popular at the moment, but the show did an excellent job of bringing him back with his own little subplot throughout the episode. The fact that they didn't jump straight into the opening titles like they normally do immediately says to me this isn't going to be your average run of the mill episode. It's quite difficult re-watching this part again seeing as everything seemed to be going so well for this small group of people, but I shouldn't have placed the fondness of my heart within these characters and I have only myself to blame for putting myself into that position. It becomes even more apparent later on that the show was banking on us sympathising with these hardworking people who are collected together to make whatever it is they're making. I'm unsure if this section is set on the quiet isle or if we're in land, but I'm going to assume it's in land because of those blokes on horses who just come along and make everyone's life a misery. The dialogue Sandor and Brother Ray share is fantastic. Their discussion of the justice of the gods and how Sandor survived Survived, created a really awesome relationship between the two. When the worshippers of the Red God come along, I certainly wondered about the potential for the Brotherhood without banners making a return, as well as Lady Stoneheart making a potential appearance. We saw the phrase ready to kill Edmure in the same way as they killed Catelyn, and God knows where these blokes have come from. Either way, this fanatical religion is on the rise and they're getting bigger by the hour. The end of the episode where the Hound sees the bloodbath that he narrowly missed was a beautiful moment that captured the pointlessness of man's efforts excellently. The construction that everyone worked so hard for eventually would become the leader's final place of rest whilst the others are spread out away from the hanging. It's sad, it's beautiful and I can't wait to see what the Hound gets up to next. In King's Landing, Marjorie decides she doesn't want to fuck a child anymore and the High Sparrow convinces Marjorie that her grandmother needs to become part of this cult or else suffer the consequences. Come on Elena, it's 2016! Ah oh, god, her scene was hilarious, especially with Scepter Unella standing there the entire time. You can almost hear what's going on inside her mind with those vicious facial expressions. When Marjorie handed over the scribble on a piece of paper though, there's this rather unnecessary crunching sound that makes it look like she has just broken the Queen of Thorns wrist. We see her unfold the piece of paper later anyway, why is this sound so loud? This makes me suspicious that Septa would have heard this and Marjorie's plan will all go tits up from here. Her performance is quite grossly uncomfortable but really effective in playing out the High Sparrow's puppet. Even Elena performs fantastically, just from her facial expressions alone right here we can see that she She's just going to have to be patient before anything can be done, but expresses reassurance too that Marjorie's not that easily swayed. Up in the north, Sansa begins travelling around to see if any of her dad's old buddies can help in reclaiming Winterfell. Our first visit is with the wildlings who accept his offer. Unfortunately, the giant in this scene sticks out like a sore thumb in that he's just been pasted over the image right here. I preferred seeing him on his own at a low angle shot to establish his size. In this shot here, it just looks rather odd. Part two of this adventure was very well constructed and kudos to that child actor, that is how you behave like an adult. This scene was fantastic purely because of the expectations I had were absolutely smashed when I saw how fierce this character is despite her size. With the tyrannous and pathetic child kings we've had to put up with in King's Landing for the past five years or so, this one shows us how it's done really well. The dialogue is well written and would have been spoiled had the actress not been so fantastic. Part three allowed me to consider that many
many of those loyal to the Boltons are now doing it out of fear of losing their power or because of old prejudices, which is very interesting as I wasn't expecting a rejection for the three characters to hold so much weight. This section concludes with the irritations and conflicts within the parties that are opposing the Boltons and the possibility of a second battle for Winterfell coming at our doorstep very soon. I can't fucking wait. Jamie Bronn and the army of Lannisters march up to Riverrun and I can't help but feel he's been shoehorned in here again for the sake of having an entertaining substitute for Illyn Payne again. In the book I remember Payne was the one who helped teach Jamie how to fight with his left hand as well as aiding him take back Riverrun. Bronn's funny, yeah, but that's all he appears to be now in the show. The entertaining sidekick of the Lannister brothers. He wasn't needed in the Dornish segments and he's certainly not necessary now. The part where Edmure was about to get hanged was very interesting though. Brynden Blackfish's presence is very much felt in the first shot we see of him, mostly clammed up in armour and his ability to see his nephew won't be executed before he even gives the command adds to this further. The contrast between the Lannisters well structured heavily armoured army and the shit stained Freys who are barely able to walk in the mud works really well in establishing how badly the siege is going. His parley with Brynden is set up fantastically. Despite how immense and strong the army looked prior to this, Jamie is shot as if he's very small but constantly thinking out his strategy, almost like Tyrion would. The music and cinematography allows us to see first hand that this fight won't be easy for Jamie. there's a lot of factors to consider which Blackfish brings up in their conversation that follows. The dialogue is once again fantastic, making me very excited for this siege to take place or any kind of conflict between the two houses in the future of the series. Down in... Well, somewhere in Essos, I'm guessing Volantis? We see lots of Ironborn being horny, and I wonder if Theon didn't want to down Ale purely based on the fact that pissing must really hurt for him. Either that, or he doesn't like to be reminded that the source of his manhood has been stripped from him. Either way, this part was quite intriguing to watch, even if it was rather pointless. As soon as Arya's scene started, my mind was telling me how fucked she was walking around with her normal face on. I can't say I saw the waif stabbing her coming, but she sure as hell could have prevented it. I reckon next week's episode will have some kind of turnaround where it wasn't actually Arya who got stabbed or something involving the changing of faces. This is slightly contradicted by the fact that we hear Arya's voice, but then again the faceless men may learn how to imitate voices too, so I'm not jumping to any conclusions yet. This segment was pretty great as I really want to know what is going to happen. Sweet Jesus, give me next week's episode. So... Did it suck? This week's episode was fantastic as always. The first half of the series was building itself up really well and now we are seeing the pinnacles of this next wave of tension bubbling now. I still think episode 5 is my favourite thus far for many obvious reasons but this episode was still great and I can't fucking wait for the next episode. Subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. Here are the outtakes. This week's review is going to be slightly different in that I'm going to discuss each... Fucking hell. No... The construction that everyone worked so hard for eventually would become the leader's final rest of place. <laughs> rest of place. In King's Landing, Marjorie decides she doesn't want to fuck a child anymore and the High Sparrow... No, not the High Sparrow, you tosser. Up in the north, Sansa begins travelling around to see if any of his dad's old buddies... His dad? Her dad. <laughs> oh dear. The contrast between the Lannisters' well-structured, heavily armoured army and the shit-stained Freys who barely uh, mm, No, thank you. This week's episode was as fantastic as bleh. Repentance. Fornication. Secrets. Repentance. I want naked. Fornication. <laughs> this is such a great app.